Okay, we will get started. Welcome everyone and thank you for joining the webinar. Um, this webinar is being presented by the Female Scientific Committee of the Uncle Fertility Consortium and several members of the committee are on the web webinar, so thank you for joining. The title of today's webinar is The Impact of Radiation Therapy on Fertility Outcomes, and I owe oh, an apology to the audience because this should actually read female fertility outcomes. So we hope those of you who are here to hear about male fertility will, will continue to join us and give us your perspective. Um, we have three presenters with us today, and I'll introduce them briefly and then allow them to start the presentation. So uh, Professor Hamish Wallace is a consultant pediatric oncologist at the Royal Hospital for Sick Children in Edinburgh and serves as a national clinical director of the Managed Service Network for Children and Young People with Cancer. Professor Winship is an Australian Research Council Fellow in the Ovarian Biology Laboratory and Monash Biomedicine Discovery Institute. Um, her research is focused on female re reproductive tract uh, and, repro and reproductive cancer, and she has established a niche in uterine and placental biology as relates to oncofertility in particular. And Dr. Junia Rosen is a consultant gynecologist specializing in fertility, reproductive endocrinology, and fertility preservation at Royal Women's Hospital in Melbourne, Australia. Professor Wallace will give his presentation, followed by Professor Winship and then uh, Professor Rosen. Please add any questions that you have into the chat and I can answer, or I can um, moderate that at the end of the session. Professor Wallace, you may begin. Well, <clears throat> thank you very much indeed. I hope everybody can hear me and see me. I'm actually speaking to you not from Edinburgh, but in fact from Italy where I'm on vacation and it's 10 o'clock in the evening. So good evening to you all. So thanks for asking me to speak about the effect of therapeutic radiation on the human ovary and to include clinical aspects. Um, before we can really think about the effect of radiation on the human ovary, we need to think about this concept of ovarian reserve. How many immature oocytes or also called non-growing follicles are actually present in the ovary at different ages? <clears throat> It's important to understand this as best we can so that we can then look at the effect of radiation on the human ovary, because obviously it's very age dependent. So this is a model that uh, Tom Kelsey and I came up with about 13 years ago. Um, the only fixed point in this uh, model is that at the moment of conception, there are zero, zero non-growing follicles in the ovary. And then by 18 to 22 weeks, <clears throat> the full amount of immature oocytes, non-growing follicles has formed, and then they decline really quite rapidly. This is a logarithmic uh, model by atresia towards the menopause at an average age of 50. And our, our model actually predicts menopause at 50, which is very reassuring. And this is data mined from eight histological studies which included 325 ovaries, which were sectioned, and the number of immature eggs, ovaries, oocytes counted. If we look at this uh, figure in another way, and putting some numbers on it, we can see the rapid establishment of the ovarian reserve, the number of immature eggs in the ovary, by about 18 to 22 weeks post-conception, where there are on average about 300,000, but a wide range, a very wide range, two and a half million, and for those with a low ovarian reserve, probably about 35,000. And that's about the same number as are present at birth. So on average, about 300,000 immature oocytes present in each ovary of a normal woman. And you can see that by the age of uh, 13 already, there's been a significant decline, with on average about 180,000 left, by 25, on average, about 65,000 left. And then <clears throat> as we approach the menopause, by the age of 35, we've only got an average of 16,000, but a wide variation, which will account, we think, for the variation that we do see in the age at which women 
actually to attain a natural menopause. So this is the concept of ovarian reserve, which is very important to understand if we're going to look at the effect of radiation, therapeutic radiation on the ovary. This is another quite useful way of looking at it. This is the percentage of the NGF population remaining as against age. So obviously at zero age, at the moment of conception, you've got 100%. And you can see that already in the prepubertal years, the ovary is very active. And by the age of 20, you're down to 36% of what you started with in terms of non-grain follicles, immature oocytes. By the age of 30, we're down to 12%. And we know that as we get older, fertility declines. And there we are, 3% only of your original immature oocyte pool at the age of 40. I know that's depressing, but, <clears throat> but that is the very important underlying biology of ovarian reserve on which we can then look at the effects of therapeutic radiation. So coming back to our original figure, let's consider two patients. Let's consider, first of all, Anna, who is uh, 18 years of age. She's going to have some cancer treatment. We don't know what her ovarian reserve is. As it happens, her ovarian reserve is below average, okay? So she has her treatment, it's gonadotoxic, it takes her ovarian reserve down to here, and then the rest decline exponentially. Biotresia may be faster than that, such that she's going to enter a premature menopause, premature ovarian insufficiency under 30, probably about 27. But if we, if we have a Bella, it, so the same gonadotoxic insult, but a young woman of the same age with her above average ovarian reserve, you can see that with the same insult, she's actually going to develop premature ovarian insufficiency, probably by about the age of 40, so maybe some 12 years later. Therefore, for the Bella, the same insult, perhaps she is going to have a window of opportunity for fertility after her cancer treatment is successful and completed, whereas for Anna, with reduced ovarian reserve, that's probably not going to be possible. So our understanding of the ovarian reserve, the concept of ovarian reserve has led, led us to be able to work out that the LD50 for the human oocyte was less than two gray. So a dose of two gray will deplete the number of immature oocytes, non-grain follicles in your ovary by 50%. We're able to do that by knowing the age at which a dose was received and the age at which they were definitely in menopause or premature ovarian insufficiency. And we published that in 2003. So that's an important, important finding that underpins our ability to predict the effect of radiation on the ovary. We then published in the red journal uh, this figure. So here's age at radiotherapy in years against predicted age at premature ovarian insufficiency on the y-axis. So here we have different doses of radiation along the top. This blue line is no radiation at all. So we would expect, therefore, to have a natural menopause on or about the age of 50. But there's one gray, two gray, three gray. Here we have the line for six gray radiation. And you can see that a, a young woman receiving a dose of six gray to the ovary, the one furthest away from the radiation field, is going to, in our predicted model, develop premature ovarian insufficiency at just over the age of 32. She's probably going to be subfertile for about 10 years before that, so that her fertility window is going to be compromised and it's unlikely that she will be able to have an opportunity to have children after her successful cancer treatment. So that's the background. We're going to talk a little bit more detail in a minute, but I want to just stress that there is a role for the oncologist in preserving fertility, and that's very important. It's not just all about putting tissue, um, it, harvested tissue into the fridge. And with my colleagues in Europe, we've published two papers in the Lancet Oncology over the last couple of years, looking at the treatment of classic Hodgkin's lymphoma, and particularly looking at whether we can remove a gonadotoxic agent, procarbazine, and replace it by a non-gonadotoxic agent, decarbazine. 
So by removing an antitoxic chemotherapy, procarbazine, a very good treatment for Hodgkin's lymphoma, but we can replace it effectively. We've shown that we can remove that gonadotoxic insult and less chance of premature ovarian insufficiency. And the other way of, of course, of reducing uh, radiation exposure to organs is to consider the protons versus photons question. And I'm going to discuss that in a bit more detail next. So why are protons so interesting for us as oncologists? The standard radiation treatment is by photons, which are x-rays. And here's the tumour located, let's say, just, just under 30 centimetres under the surface of the body, OK? And you can see that the dose distribution of delivering x-rays photons is a high dose early on. And actually getting the radiation dose to the tumour is quite difficult because there's actually a huge spread of irradiation to tissues that you don't want to irradiate that surround the tumour. The advantage of protons is this Bragg peak effect where the radiation is delivered to the tumour with less scatter radiation to surrounding normal tissue. So potentially protons are going to spare normal tissue. So let's look at a worked up, uh, a worked up case and compare the photon x-ray plan with the proton plan. So bear with me, this is a 16 year old girl. She's got a Ewing's sarcoma involving her sacrum. And we want to irradiate this area outlined here, the top left. We want to give that at least 55 gray, a very big dose of radiation. Here is where we think the uterus is. And on this axial, here's where we think the ovaries are. And this is the normal photon plan. And you can see that the dose distribution with photons, unfortunately, delivers really quite a significant dose to both the uterus and the ovaries as shown in this figure here. So this is the dose delivered to the ovaries, and this is the dose delivered to the uterus. But if we change the plan and deliver protons, we find that actually we are able to spare normal tissue. Here is the full dose being delivered to the tumor itself, the Ewing sarcoma. Here's the uterus, and here on the absolute view are the ovaries. And we can see that the dose received by the ovary furthest away from the radiation field is significantly reduced by the proton plan. We published this quite recently and have produced a predictive model of the effect of therapeutic radiation on the human ovary. And attached to this publication is a website which is active, which I'll show what it produces. So this is our case, our 16 year old, here she is at 16, age at radiotherapy. And here are the two plans, okay? So this is the standard plan delivering photons. And we estimate that she is going to develop, because of the dose, the six gray mean, up to maybe eight, maybe as low as just over seven, so mean of seven, between six and eight gray, to the ovary furthest away from the radiation field, is going to predict that she will go into premature ovarian insufficiency before the age of 30 with the photon plan. But if we deliver the proton plan, where the dose of radiation is significantly reduced, she is likely to have a normal opportunity for fertility and go into natural menopause at 50. So a huge difference in terms of predicted age at premature ovarian insufficiency, dependent upon the delivery the, of the radiotherapy. And we can take this one step further and we can say, look, <clears throat> this is again the this is the photon plan and this is the proton plan. What we're doing here is we're doing two things. We're saying if she has a reduced ovarian reserve, she's going to fail even earlier. If she had an above average, she will fail later, but still not a lot later than the age of 30. And if we've got the dose slightly, we're not sure about the dose, that's the dose range that's received by the ovary we can see that there's a variation there. So this is really important potential information for the radiation oncologist to say, look, if we deliver a proton plan, we're not going to require fertility preservation for this young woman. 
But if we deliver a photon X-ray plan, the conventional treatment, then she is likely to develop premature ovarian insufficiency sometime around the age of 30, maybe as late as 35. That's if she's got a high ovarian reserve. And that she may well therefore be a good candidate for fertility preservation, if that's possible. So this is the algorithm <clears throat> on the website. It's hosted at St. Andrews by my colleague, Dr. Tom Kelsey. And you can go into the website, you can put in your estimated dose and come up with uh, a prediction at age of premature ovarian insufficiency, also dependent upon whether there's a high or reduced ovarian reserve or whether the dose is the, the actual dose delivered. We're not sure whether it's nearer eight than, than nearer, nearer six, for example. So here's another plan, this very briefly, this is a patient with a pineoblastoma aged eight. Here we have the photon plan, a standard plan, giving craniospinal radiotherapy to this patient. And you can see a huge scatter dose of radiation with radiation to the mediastinum, upper abdomen, and so on. Whereas the proton plan delivering a much, much smaller uh, dose to surrounding normal tissues, which has got to be beneficial, but in terms of the ovary, there's really very little advantage in delivering the proton plan versus the photon plan. And probably this patient, in terms of reproductive chances, isn't going to benefit from fertility preservation. However, the protons are going to decrease the dose of exposure to the heart, the lungs, and other tissues that may also be considered to be important. But from the ovary point of view, there isn't a great deal to be gained or craniospinal radiotherapy by delivering protons. <clears throat> and this is the incorporating the low and high ovarian reserve for the for the pineoblastoma patient with the photon plan and with the proton plan. So there is an advantage delivering both. There is a smaller dose received by the ovary, but still this patient probably is going to have the opportunity for natural fertility once they're cured. So in conclusion, our tool Combining our knowledge about the validated model of NGF, the non-grain follicle decline with age and healthy females, using our robust and conservative estimate of the LD50 being less than 2 gray, and looking at uh, the accepted technique for estimating age at premature brain insufficiency at a known dose, the tool, this tool will aid clinical decision-making about whether fertility preservation is appropriate and therefore facilitate the discussion with patients and families before treatment commences. So very briefly, I was asked to produce a real life case. This is a 15 year old girl. She actually had stage four Hodgkin's lymphoma, a long presentation with itching, widespread lymphadenopathy. This is her PET scan at presentation showing disease, really in the mediastinum, below the liver, she's got a lot of disease in this area, splenic involvement, but importantly, also a lot of pelvic bony disease. So she got stage four disease, Hodgkin's lymphoma, very curable. This patient was going to receive chemotherapy. We're going to avoid procarbazine, but, but she may require radiotherapy. And if she does require radiotherapy, the radiation field will, will include her pelvis and will expose her ovaries and uterus. So is this a patient who is, is she high risk or low risk for POI? Well, very difficult to determine because we don't know whether she's going to receive radiotherapy. So is fertility preservation with the vein tissue crowd preservation indicated for her? That's a discussion we need to have with the family. Can we do a vein tissue crowd preservation after the chemotherapy is finished before radiotherapy, bearing in mind that her ovarian reserve will be reduced, and we don't really know the answer to that. Would she benefit from a proton versus a photon plan? Well, almost certainly she would if it was possible. And of course, for this young girl, there are significant consent issues. As it happened, her parents were very keen to proceed with fertility preservation, but she herself, as the patient, was not so keen. So that's a case to think about. And bearing in mind when we're thinking about fertility preservation, our, our, our first aim is to cure the patient. 
and we mustn't do any harm by doing additional procedures that are not necessary, primum non necessary. So in the short time I had available, that's a, 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 an overview of the effect of radiation, therapeutic radiation on the ovary. There are many colleagues that I have to thank, particularly Tom Kelsey and Richard Anderson uh, with this work. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Professor Wallace. Thank you so much. We will hold questions to the end. Um, okay. It's I will I'll stop sharing now. Perfect. Can you all see my screen? We can. Mm -hmm. Amy, would you like to select slideshow just to um, put the slides up? Oh. Is that is that better now? Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Um, our work is on characterizing not only the impacts of cancer therapy mediated uterine damage, but the mechanisms of how this occurs in order to better understand how we could potentially protect this. So in our work, we use a lot of preclinical models that I'll discuss today. So when we began this work, um, our PhD student, Megan Griffiths, performed a comprehensive review of the clinical literature to ask the question whether there was any evidence to suggest cancer therapies do damage the uterus to compromise subsequent fertility. So she found that in some cases, after adolescents received uh, total body irradiation, later there was evidence of undetectable uterine artery blood flow, resistance to hormone replacement therapy, smaller uterine volume, and reduced endometrial thickness irrespective of cycle stage if they were cycling at all. So together, this suggests that radiotherapy may damage the uterine vasculature and hormone responsiveness long term. And this could be irrespective of the cyclical nature um, that we know to be true of the endometrium, given its shedding and regeneration through the menstrual cycle. However, from the clinical literature, it was unclear whether a radiation induced direct uterine damage that was sustained and lasting as opposed to loss of function that might be secondary to ovarian insufficiency or endocrine failure. So to, in order to address this research question, we turned to the mouse as a preclinical model and performed total body irradiation on adolescent mice and simply collected the uteri at a range of time points after a single high dose of irradiation of seven gray. So we can see here the red gamma H2AX stains DNA double strand breaks. And we could see that this was abundant throughout the mouse endometrium after irradiation in the luminal epithelium, which is the site of blastocyst apposition should pregnancy occur, in the stroma, which will undergo decidualization to form the decidua of pregnancy, as well as the endometrial vasculature and the myometrium or the muscular layer as well. To confirm whether this was consistent in human cells, we performed a radiation of uh, human epithelial or stromal cells. And this time the DNA damage is seen in green. And we could see that gamma H2AX is indeed abundant after a radiation in human endometrial cells. So this shows the first empirical evidence that direct uterine damage is sustained after irradiation. But what are the long-term effects of this? So turning back to the clinical literature, there is evidence that after total body irradiation, females uh, experience lower clinical pregnancy rates, reduced first embryo transfer success rates, high prevalence of pregnancy complications, and furthermore, no pregnancies reported after ovarian tissue grafting in females exposed to radiation, despite graft success evident from hormone production. 
Again, from this clinical literature, it does remain difficult to tease apart the impacts sustained from the radiation on the ovary versus the uterus. But we hypothesized that radiotherapy would permanently damage the uterus and impair its subsequent function and ability to host healthy pregnancy. We aim to determine the impacts of radiation on uterine receptivity and blastocyst implantation and pregnancy maintenance. And this had to be independent from radiotherapy mediated ovarian damage. So to do this, Megan established a novel animal model where the exposed recipient female, in this case was exposed to total body radiation, underwent uh, ovarectomy uh, to remove the confounding factor of ovarian damage and then received a transfer of healthy, unexposed donor uh, blastocysts in conjunction with exogenous hormone support that we could control. And then the pregnancy outcomes are uh, uh, assessed in the recipient. So using this model, we exposed the recipients at, at adolescent age to the high dose of irradiation and collected at an early time point to examine blastocyst implantation. So we can see here, surprisingly, after the seven grays of irradiation, we actually found no impact to the rates of blastocyst implantation in the mouse uterine horns. So mice obviously have multiple litters. Um, however, we can, we can see here that the seven gray irradiated uteri does appear pale and avascular, avascular compared to the non-irradiated control. And furthermore, we wanted to know, was the uh, pregnancy maintained at a longer time point? So we took the model out further, this time um, to mid-gestation of pregnancy, where we would expect the placenta to be developed uh, at about the second trimester equivalent of a human pregnancy. And this time we uh, dosed mice with an intermediate dose of 4.5 grays and the high dose of 7 grays to determine if there was any dose response effect. And furthermore, we designed some customized lead shields to protect the brain of the mice and thereby try and dissect the role um, of the radiation on the HPG axis, which may then impact on uterine function. So in our control implantation sites in the mouse uteri, we can see here that normal healthy implantation sites were developing in the control, but by 4.5 grays of irradiation, we could see evidence of resorption, which is equivalent to a human uh, miscarriage. And we could see total pregnancy loss in the seven gray irradiated mouse uteri, bearing in mind that we know these mice had equal rates of blastocyst implantation earlier on. And interestingly, in the shielded group, we found uh, no protective effect. So this is indicated here by the significant reduction in viable implantation sites across all those groups. So together indicating that irradiation causes pregnancy loss. But we wanted to know how this was occurring. So we sought to understand how the radiation might impact on the endometrial stromal cells and their ability to respond to hormones and undergo decidualization. So instead of transferring back healthy blastocysts, this time we just mimicked the decidualization artificially by intrauterine injection of uh, sesame oil uh, in conjunction with exogenous hormone support in a well-established model of artificial decidualization. We can see here the control non-irradiated uteri underwent uh, normal um, healthy rates of decidualization, whereas the seven gray irradiated mice underwent patchy or partial decidualization, represented here by the significant reduction in uterine weight to body weight ratio. So uterine decidualization is impaired after irradiation. Now, to see if this is consistent in human cells, 
and to define whether this is independent of any other factors such as the uterine blood flow, we performed artificial decidualization cultures in vitro using primary human endometrial stromal cells derived from healthy women papel biopsies. Um, these cells were treated with a well-established protocol of hormones that we know induces decidualization, whereby the mesenchymal cells become rounded and highly secretory. We can see in the top left panel, the um, non-irradiated mesenchymal cells have that long um, spindly phenotype. However, our control decidual uh, non-irradiated cells undergo that rounded morphology. However, this is partially impaired in the irradiated uh, decidualized cells. And this was represented by uh, the no changes to prolactin hormone secretion in the media or prolactin uh, mRNA generated by the cell lysates themselves. So together, this suggests endometrial stromal cell hormone responsiveness is impaired and this in occurs independent from dysfunctional uterine uh, blood supply. So next to address whether the blood supply actually is altered, um, we irradiated this time non-pregnant adolescent mice and dissected the uterine artery. In collaboration with Dr. Sarah Marshall at the Hudson Institute here in uh, Melbourne, Australia, she performed some functional uh, readouts of vessel function via wire myography. And we could see that there were no changes to the smooth muscle uh, vascular function after irradiation. However, the uterine artery underwent um, significant endothelial dysfunction. So irradiation does cause uh, disruptions to the uterine artery blood flow and causes endothelial dysfunction. Bearing in mind, this is in a non-pregnant setting. So this may even be exacerbated if we look in the pregnant setting in future directions. So together we've shown that radiation causes pregnancy loss in preclinical models. Uh, it causes impaired endometrial stromal cell decidualization, which is required to support placental development. And impaired decidualization is a hallmark of miscarriage and pregnancy loss. We've also shown impaired uterine artery uh, endothelial function. So this could um, be exacerbated in the setting of pregnancy, and this is something we're looking into at the moment. So our next direction was to further examine the mechanism, but also determine whether we could protect the uterus by blocking apoptosis of the uterine cells. So our lab is quite interested in blocking apoptosis as a fertility preservation strategy, not only in the uterus, but also in oocytes. So um, my supervisor, Associate Professor Carla Hutt, has the Puma knockout mice. So Puma is a key mediator of the apoptosis pathway. And this knockout is protective. Uh, the ovarian reserve is protected from chemotherapy and radiotherapy. So we simply irradiated these Puma knockouts and collected the uteri. We can see that in the wild type and the Puma knockout, they undergo extensive DNA damage in the uteri. But when we look at tunnel staining for apoptosis or cell death, this is prevented in the mouse uteri from the Puma knockout. So this indicates that by blocking apoptosis, those cells might be under, uh, able to undergo DNA repair. Uh, and so loss of Puma does prevent irradiation-induced apoptosis. But what are the functional consequences for this for uh, pregnancy? Well, the decidualization phenotype that we had previously seen in wild-type animals was restored in the Puma knockouts. And furthermore, the endothelial vessel function was restored in the Puma knockouts when compared to the Puma heterozygotes, which host one copy of the Puma gene, but not a second. So knockout of both um, Puma alleles is required for this protective effect. 
So blocking Puma is protective functionally, but what about pregnancy? So this was perhaps our most exciting preliminary finding where we did find uh, viable implantation sites after seven grays of irradiation in the Puma knockout animals using our embryo transfer preclinical model. So overall, the significance of this work is that we've developed an animal model that allows us to distinguish between ovarian dysfunction and insufficiency acting on the uterus and determine the direct damaging impacts of cancer therapies on the uterus. We're now using this to address um, other insults such as different chemotherapy agents from various classes, as well as Im immunotherapies, which we know have rapidly entered the clinic. Um, we've also shown that radiotherapy causes long-term uterine damage and pregnancy loss in preclinical models and identified specific mechanisms by which this damage occurs in order to identify potential strategies um, such as Puma, which may be a therapeutic target in the future. Overall, um, the implications of our work suggest that we must protect the ovaries and the uterus in order to maximise survivors' chances of pregnancy success. And towards this goal, I won't talk about this as this is Jenya, the next speaker's work, but we have worked together in a multidiscipline group to put together a clinical summary guide to raise awareness about the impacts of the, uh, this on the uterus. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge our lab at Monash University in Australia, led by Carla Hutt, our funding, consumers and collaborators. And thank you again for having me on this platform. Thank you so much, Professor Winship, for sharing your research and where the field is headed in terms of radiation injury to the uterus. We will now turn it over to Professor Rosen to give her presentation. Genia, you are on mute. Sorry about that. Have you got the right view yet? Sorry, I'll just go back. Thank you very much for having me. Can you see the presenter view now? Yes, thank you. Yes. Great. Um, so good morning, everyone from morning in, in Melbourne. Um, so I'm speaking about the more clinically um, orientated out fertility outcomes and um, fertility preservation options pre and post radiotherapy. So this was the brief and I added onto that the uterine assessment, which I think is so important in this area. So by way of background, who are the patients that we're actually seeing with these conditions? So they are the women who've had abdominal pelvic radiation for sarcomas such as Ewing sarcoma, colorectal cancers, um, cervical or uterine cancers and bladder cancers. And of course, the group for who are having TBI for hematological malignancies as well. Obviously, a lot of these women um, in the abdominal pelvic radiation group are going to be older, but increasingly we're seeing women who are in the reproductive age because they may not have started or completed their family. So this is an important issue, and I'm so glad uh, that we're discussing the uterus today. So we already know um, about the ovarian effects from radiation. Ovaries are extremely radiosensitive. Um, but what I think is really interesting with respect to the uterus is that with age, the uterus becomes more radioresistant and the prepubertal uterus is much more vulnerable to the effects of radiation, which is exactly the opposite to what the ovaries experience, becoming uh, more radiosensitive with age. Of course, uterine damage depends on doses of radiotherapy, the site, um, and the delivered dose to the uterus, we have to always bear in mind, may be very different to what the tumour doses are. And that's where working with the oncology team is really important to determine what, you know, what um, 
doses the uterus has been exposed to and the gonads as well. As for, from some of the older studies that um, have mainly done work, you know, that, that's where all most of our information comes from. Um, some of the rules of thumb is that under, um, under four grades thought to um, not affect the uterus significantly, um, between 14 and 30 grades, there's thought to be um, potentially irreversible dysfunction of the uterus. And traditionally, over 40 gray will consider doses to be sterilizing to the uterus, so completely um, at odds with future pregnancy. And um, I'll, I'll go into that a little bit later because there are many case reports now showing that pregnancy has occurred with higher doses. So um, a summary of tumours, their average doses, and of course this is going to be very, uh, very much individual in terms of what the uterus has received. Um, but what I think is really interesting is um, showing that there have been reported births um, with, for example, rectal cancers, where very, very high doses have been uh, delivered to the uterus and some of the other um, pelvic cancers as well. And of course, there are many reported births after TBI. So uh, Amy has gone into some of the possible mechanisms of damage to the reproductive function of the uterus. And I think it's so important to be doing that work on looking at the, those biological mechanisms. But essentially, if we're thinking about the impaired supply limiting the placental um, function or placental invasion and development, defective endometrial function and myometrial fibrosis, which is going to reduce the distensibility, volume and elasticity of the uterus. Um, so as pregnancy progresses, that may cause significant issues and we know it does. So what does the data tell us? So coming from very big um, cohort studies, that 2015 Gao um, et al. study looked at, it was a meta-analysis of 14 cohort studies. Um, we think that there is a significantly increased risk of infertility in this population. So children, adolescents, whose uteri were exposed at that age and then went on to um, attempt conception, so had a higher risk of infertility. There did not appear, in, interestingly, to be an increase in miscarriage, and that is, um, for some reason, a different result to what we see for TBI, total body radiation, but that might be to do with the reporting of the results. Preterm birth, significantly higher odds ratio, with um, delivery before 37 weeks, low birth weight or intrauterine growth restriction, and importantly, reassuringly, no increase in congenital mal malformations. In this age group, there were consistent reports of reduced uterine volume. In the post-pubertal adult um, exposure, there are less numbers of studies, less participants included. And we have to remember that some of the limitations to studying fertility outcomes in this population is actually isolating the ovarian effects from the uterine effects, as well as some of the difficulties in testing uterine function, as opposed to, for example, you know, the blood tests that help us determine ovarian function. And so as a result, our data is somewhat limited to data sets from cancer survivors. And obviously the information therein, you know, some of that granularity and important findings are lost when we're thinking about big data sets. So for TBI in the adult population, um, we're talking about approximately 60 pregnancies in, in those studies. Um, they show increased preterm birth, low birth weight, and majority do show an increase in miscarriage as well. So, some of the, the, the one bigger study from Western Australia in 2014 looked at 340 women who'd had chemo, radi chemo radiation therapy or radiotherapy alone, again, showing increased preterm birth and low birth weight. So again, this is a table that, um, we that, that was in the 2020 study that we published. And the other important studies I would say in this area are actually limited to case reports. And there've been approximately six or seven now um, that have looked at quite high doses 
Um, you can see circled there, 54, 30, 55, 58 gray, and um, subsequent pregnancy after those doses. The complications in these pregnancies that have been reported, again, include the ones we would expect, preeclampsia, preterm birth, low birth weight, um, and as well as placental complications such as accreta and percreta. So just to make it clinically relevant um, to talk about the obstetric sort of course for one of the patients um, who my colleague looked after in our unit, a 26-year-old with rectal cancer who was treated with surgery and chemotherapy. She'd had uh, three embryos, some eggs and ovarian tissue prior preserved prior to her treatment. And subsequently after having not conceived with the embryos and eggs, went on to have ovarian tissue grafting to the pelvis and abdominal wall sites. She subsequently, after the fourth embryo transfer, but many more egg collections, um, conceived. And she had a really successful outcome in the sense that she had a term birth at 38 weeks after rupturing her membranes via emergency caesarean section. The baby's, her baby girl's weight was 3.3 kilograms. She did have weekly cervical surveillance that revealed a shortened cervix at 13 weeks. And she actually, that was when she underwent her first cervical cerclage, which was very difficult as the cervix was flush with the vagina and then went on to have another cerclage after that. So in terms of the summary of pregnancy outcomes, there are clear increases in the risk of infertility, preterm birth, low birth weight and miscarriage. Other more rare but significant complications included uterine rupture. There was one report of that, placenta percreta and stillbirth as well. But importantly, there were lots of healthy pregnancies reported in the literature as well. It's clear that there are worse outcomes when radiotherapy is delivered at a younger age. And the importance of managing pregnancies of this nature in a multidisciplinary high-risk unit with regular monitoring cannot be overstated because of these you know, very, very significant complications which can occur. So in terms of looking at options, fertility preserving options before and after radiotherapy, unfortunately, we, we don't have a lot of options. I think one of the most important ones is actually prevention or fertility sparing management of um, women's tumours. And um, Hamish described that well, that there are, there are newer options such as the intensity modulated radiation therapy. That's the more... Um, to traditional photon therapy, where the radiation conforms more um, precisely around the tumour and therefore less dose can be delivered to uh, spare pelvic structures such as the uterus and the ovaries. Also, sometimes partial uterine radiation is possible, so affecting less of the uterine volume. And I think that that's one of the sort of mainstays of treatment because and, and the more sort of awareness and better communication that we as fertility specialists have with our oncologists, the more this can be sort of front of mind and, um, and maximised and optimised. The other and very much experimental option in this area is uterine transposition. The first report um, was, it was first, the technique was first reported in 2017 and it was in subsequent case reports and also case series over the next few years showing that it is a technique capable of restoring uterine and gonadal function and successfully preserve the uterus. But it was not until this year, 2023, that um, there was a publication in Fertility Sterility just a couple of months ago with a first birth um, reported in a 28-year-old who'd had a myxoid lipocytoma and had uterine um, transposition Subsequently, I think it was one, approximately one month after completion of radiation that the uterus was um, returned back to its original site. And the patient a few years later went on to actually against um, medical advice. She inadvertently conceived, um, 
and had a fairly successful outcome. The procedure, the technique is similar to laparoscopic hysterectomy, um, but importantly, careful um, dissection of the IP ligaments occurs in order to be able to move the uh, uterus and the gonads into the upper abdomen. So I think this is actually a really exciting uh, development, obviously very much in its infancy, but has, has potential for the future. So post-radiation treatment fertility options, um, essentially there are none. I would say at the moment, um, uterine transplantation it has, of course, um, been performed over the last few years. It is a very complex medical procedure. It is only done in a few places in the world. There are case reports of successful births, um, and the but but there are potential downsides, um, major downsides such as the high cost, high risk, um, and of course pregnancy complications as well. So it's, I'm not sure it's something that's going to become a mainstay of treatment. Um, sex steroids, not really a fertility preserving option, but importantly, it does improve um, some of the parameters where, that we think about um, in terms of the uterus. It improves blood flow um, and uh, after hormone replacement therapy, um, using it for three months was a study now quite, quite an old study, 1999. But the optimal regimen is uncertain and there's substantial individual variation in response. So some uteri seem to be much more resistant to steroids than others. And that may have to do with factors such as the age at which radiation was delivered, the dose, et cetera. What about pentoxifilin and vitamin E? The last study that actually looked at um, looked at this combination for irradiated uteruses was in 2002, and there actually haven't been any studies that I could find since then. Um, the pentoxifilin inhibits fibroblast proliferation, and the vitamin E removes reactive oxygen species produced during oxidative stress. And as a result, um, that study, as well as studies in other areas, um, do show regression of uterine radiation changes. Um, the doses of uh, these, these medications are there, so 800 milligrams of pentoxifilin combined with 1,000 IU of vitamin E used for nine months. There are a few studies that have looked at this combination for thin endometrium, so not outside of the radiation space. So given the lack of really pre- and post-fertility uh, preservation options, what we really want to know at this point um, is how to assess uterine function. And that comes down to whether it would be successful and also safe to embark on pregnancy. So if women have frozen eggs, embryos, or uh, uterine tissue from which we can get eggs, is it safe for them to actually try to conceive with their uterus? So we're talking there about, number one, the likelihood of the pregnancy occurring. Um, but also then the risk of complications and making sure that we keep our patients safe. So in terms of assessment, um, we're looking at, number one, the ultrasound. Um, and there, there are some studies that look at um, the blood flow in the uterus, the volume um, and the endometrial thickness. And they look at the radiation group compared to a similar endocrine group such as POI, but also give them both um, in hormone replacement. But importantly, there are no measurements to guide management. So the results of the ultrasound, um, we, we don't currently have a way to correlate that with whether pregnancy is possible. The other modality, the other important modality in the space is MRI. Radiation-induced changes to the my myometrium can be demonstrated by decreased T2 signal intensity. And there's a very old study now, 1989, which um, suggests that that is similar. The changes that are seen after radiation are similar to those in post-menopausal um, women, while the Milgram study that also looks at um, these patients they think that there's direct, that it looks to be, in terms of their control group, it looks like there's direct um, damage 
of the uterus from radiation itself, which, which makes a lot of sense from what we know. The third modality we have at hand is histology. So endometrial, timed endometrial biopsy after sequential estrogen and progesterone, then looking at the essentially using modified noise criteria to look for cellular differentiation and secretory changes. And the receptivity, um, the receptivity assays don't haven't specifically looked at women with radiation, but um, have that there was one study looking at women with thin endometrium that seemed to be useful in that space. So clearly we have lots of gaps in the knowledge, gaps in our knowledge that need to be addressed. And um, there are a number of ways of doing that and registry is something that I, um, that, that seems a little bit blue sky at this point, but I, I had started that a number of years ago when I started my PhD, but, um, it is quite an undertaking. So if anyone is interested in doing something like that, I think that would go a long way towards um, finding out more about this population as well as having a group that we can recruit for studies as well. Imaging studies um, and endometrial biopsy studies as well would help us. But in the meantime, I think we have to be pragmatic and um, these patients that we do see in clinic who have the clinical question of what do we do after they've had radiation and want to embark on pregnancy. Um, we, in our unit, have patient information where we talk about the, you know, what we know and what we don't know. Um, and to, to, to be able to address future reproduction. The other thing is that um, we have a management plan, again, um, acknowledging the deficiencies in the data, but using the assessments of the ultrasound, MRI and endometrial testing to then guide us as to, as to whether we can um, help that patient try to conceive. So the, um, some of the important things that, that we highlight in our clinical guidance is the importance of a multidisciplinary team when we're thinking about um, women in the, in the situation, so radiation oncologists, discussion of their uterine ghost, fractionation, um, involving high-risk obstetrician early, clear documentation regarding the risks, of course, the management in, in pregnancy um, with very close surveillance. And lastly, just again to demonstrate some of these principles in action, um, I have a patient, a 29-year-old, who was diagnosed with rectal cancer in 2021. She had seven eggs frozen prior to starting her chemo radiation. The dose delivered to her uterus and ovaries was 25 gray. She subsequently has um, ovarian insufficiency and is using hormone replacement. Now she plans, she's hoping to get pregnant two or two and a half years after completion of her treatment. And we've completed a high risk obstetric assessment for her. Um, we've also performed an endometrial biopsy after sequential hormones that came back showing a uh, very appropriate um, post ovulatory day five endometrium. Her initial ultrasound showed a thickened posterior myometrium, which the Technologists thought might be secondary to radiotherapy. Um, we're not quite sure of the significance of this finding. Um, and there were a couple of other findings like blood clots in the uterine cavity and a possible hydrocelping. But when we repeated the ultrasound about four to five months later, um, the conclusion was that the pelvis was atrophic um, and that posterior thickening of the myometrium was still present. The MRI of her pelvis showed a slightly small uterus, but there was no significant myometrial fibrosis identified, which was great news. Our plan when she's ready is to warm um, her eggs to create embryos and to start a um, transfer cycle. So just mindful of the time, um, key points to take away. The uterus may be more resistant to radiotherapy than previously understood. Part of this is to do with individual radiosensitivity. We know that pathogenesis of late radiotherapy sequelae is very 
much variable between people. And so therefore you try an assessment and decision-making around fertility treatment um, has to take into consideration the important things such as the age when the uterus was exposed to, to treatment and the actual dose of radiation exposure. So working together with the oncologist to create, for example, a dose volume histogram, and that would be important for studies um, reporting consistent results in that as well, in terms of the exposure of the uterus. I'd like to acknowledge multidisciplinary members of my team, especially Kate Stern, who you can see there, and I'll stop sharing. Thank you all very much. Thank you to our uh, attendees and thank you especially to our presenters for this um, information. It's, it shows that there are a lot of gaps in care in this population and we appreciate this. Um, yes, so in terms, I have a question for um, Amy first. Well, actually, um, Jeannie, let's start with you. So the pentoxin and Pentoxifiline vitamin E, have you seen that that is actually being used in clinical practice just yet? Um, I've, I've looked at the literature myself and I've seen those studies, but nothing since then. And you, and you agree that that's not been a, a formulation, a route, it, that sort of thing has not been optimized. Yeah, it's interesting that there's just nothing like it, everything stopped dead. <laughs> Perhaps we need to start again. I, I don't know if it's because of concerns of safety in, in other areas. I do wonder why we haven't been using it, but no, I haven't seen anyone use it. Right. And I've seen that they've used it in other areas for radiation. So um, we'll have to look at that. Thank you. Um, Dr. Uh, Professor Winship, question for you with your Puma knockout mice, how do you anticipate that might look in clinical practice in, in terms of treatments or protective therapies? Yeah, so that's a great question. We actually do have a small molecule inhibitor of Puma now. Um, it's only been used in preclinical studies, so in mice and in human ovarian cortical sections in culture um, and shown to be protective of chemotherapy, um, not radiotherapy yet. So that's something that our lab and our others are still working on. But yeah, there is there is a small molecule inhibitor and whether or not that is translational to clinical patients is, I guess, a, a future direction. Thank you. And then Professor Wallace, um, we know that there's been you know, a lot of talk about the GNR agonist, GNRH agonist on the ovary, and that hasn't proven um, consistent across populations. And of course, that's for, against chemotherapy-induced injury. Beyond transitioning to photon therapy for treatments, do you foresee any treatments that are going to be protective of the ovary? In terms of um, the radiation effect? Yes, Or sir. chemotherapy? Either. Well, I think the most important thing is, is, to, is to use modern te techniques of radiotherapy. <clears throat> so not everybody has access to either um, IMRT or, or, or proton therapy, uh, proton therapy rather. And um, you can see from what I've shown that you really can deliver your radiotherapy dose to the target so much more accurately without, without particularly in the pelvis, without irradiating the ovaries and uterus. So that has to be the important message that we get across to our radiation oncologists. And it's very difficult to do that because it's actually quite a lot of work for them to, in, in, in their planning, for them to work out those to the ovary furthest away from the radiation field and those to the uterus. <clears throat> and of course, the ovary moves. So the treatment, you know, we might be delivering 20 or 30 treatments over several weeks. And of course, the ovary, the ovaries change position. So that's why <clears throat> I included in my study a variation of dose. Um, you know, because it might be lower, it might be higher. So it, it, it's all about trying to get the radiation oncologist who is, of course, busy, trying very hard to deliver radiotherapy safely to his patients, their patients, <clears throat> and doing this extra work to see, well, can we improve the radiation plan 
to actually take organs out of the radiation field that are going to be important for the survivor in the future. In, in terms of chemotherapy, you know, I think we are making advances there. And the, the Hodgkin's study that I briefly alluded to, I didn't present the data from that, but it is in those publications that I that I mentioned. You know, we have been able to remove a gonadotoxic agent from chemotherapy for Hodgkin's lymphoma in young people successfully and replace it with a non-gonadotoxic agent and shown quite clearly that those patients are less likely to develop premature ins ovarian insufficiency. So <clears throat> there's a lot of work to be done in terms of getting our you know, oncologists on board. I'm an oncologist, but most oncologists find dealing with reproductive and fertility issues actually quite challenging. They actually find it quite challenging to do that because what they're thinking about is clinical studies, chemotherapy, other molecules, MABs and MIBs, and all the new stuff that's available. And actually thinking about the quality of the survivorship is actually quite a difficult issue for them, particularly up front at the beginning when it becomes important to, to try and make these decisions. So that's how I would respond to your question. Thank you. Excellent response. Thank you. And thank you for your work with the calculator. I think that will be very helpful for a lot of individuals. One last question before we go. Um, can any of this information be translated to radioactive iodine treatment for thyroid cancer? Do we think this is the same? It's not the same level of risk, but and that's, that's open to anyone in terms of the effects of radioactive iodine treatment for thyroid cancer and whether or not that has any impact on uterine development or uterine function or ovarian function. Not a very I'm not question. sure. Yeah, we haven't looked into that, sorry. <laughs> no worries, sorry. Well, thank you so much for your time. Thank you all for attending. If the speakers would stay on one moment for me and if Mahmood, if you could stay on for one moment, just one moment longer, that'd be great. Thank you all, have a good rest of your day. And this will be online on the Uncle Fertility Consortium website for you to access.